Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, good morning, Rescue Church. I want to say welcome to each and every one of you that are watching online. Welcome to our iCampus. Hey, my name is John Sanders, and it is my pleasure and honor to get to present the message this weekend. If uh, if you don't know me, uh, for many years, I had the privilege of serving as the lead pastor of the Rescue Church. And a few years ago, well, last year, I guess early 2020, I stepped out of that role and into a new season of ministry and uh, having a lot of fun with that and just grateful for the opportunity to be back. I'm still a part of the Rescue Church, uh, but just grateful for the opportunity from time to time to get to be able to preach. And so uh, as Pastor Sam is away this weekend, he asked if I would fill in, and I was more than happy to do that. Guys, we've been in a series the last few weeks at the Rescue Church talking about the purposes of the church. And uh, it's really important to note that when we talk about God's will or his purpose, his design for the church, that what he's really talking about is his purpose for our lives as individuals, right? Because the church is nothing more than the gathering of God's individual people, and we're brought together, we're gathered together in this thing called the church. So if it's God's will for the rescue church, what I want you to hear is that the purposes we're talking about are actually God's will for your life and for my life. Today, I have the privilege to talk with you all about the purpose of discipleship. And I'm going to make this really blunt and and really to the point. We were created to become like Jesus Christ, to be his followers. That's what it means to be a disciple is that we are in a process more and more, little by little, each and every day of becoming more and more like Jesus and following him that our lives begin to look like his life. You know, sometimes we confuse the word discipleship with an intellectual head knowledge, like, well, to be a disciple means that I know a lot more about the Bible, or I know more Bible verses, or I know more theology, and I know things about God. That's not discipleship. That That's a part of discipleship, but true discipleship, true following Jesus is about living like him and acting like him, where more and more our lives reflect the life of Jesus Christ. And so today I want to make three statements about spiritual growth, about discipleship, because that's really what we're talking about. To be a Christ follower means that we are spiritually growing up. So the first statement I want to make is very simple. God wants me to grow up spiritually. Like This is God's will for your life and for my life. It's one of our purposes is to grow up spiritually. I want to share Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. But before we read this, I just want to point out, if you go read the verses right before this passage of Scripture, you will understand in its context, the Apostle Paul just said that the reason God gave pastors and leaders to the church was to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. And the only reason I'm pointing that out is so much of the work that I do with pastors around the country, I continually run into pastors who are discouraged. They feel burned out. They feel disillusioned in ministry. And one of the problems is that their people, by and large, are looking to the pastor to do all of the work of the ministry. You got these pastors that are just overworked and the, the church treats them like, well, hey, pastor, you are the professional. That's why we pay you to do the work of the ministry. That is not why we pay the pastor. The pastor is the leader. The pastor is the equipper to equip the rest of us to do the work of ministry. But then we're going to pick it up. Paul goes on to say in verse 13, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. See, God's will is not for us to be immature, but mature. 
We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the church, his body. So listen, guys, this is God's will for you and I. It is for us to grow up spiritually. But the truth is, sadly, many Christians fail to grow up spiritually. They grow older, but they don't grow up spiritually. Their their bodies grow and get bigger, but their spiritual discipleship, their following, the the level to which they follow Jesus doesn't really grow. And I believe there's some reasons for that. We're going to look at a few of them in our time together today. But Clearly, point number one, it is God's will for you and I to grow up spiritually. Number two, this is important. I want to point this out. Spiritual growth has two parts. God's part and my part or your part. Like God definitely plays a role in our spiritual growth. We cannot grow without him. But we're going to learn that we also have a role to play in our spiritual growth It's not something that we can just set on autopilot and say, okay, just grow and let it grow. Like we have to be a part of the growth process in our spiritual development. So Philippians chapter two, listen to this, chapter two, verses 12 and 13. The apostle Paul writes this, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So notice we got two words there. We've got the word work out and we've got the word work in. We're going to start with that one. Here's God's part. God has promised that he will do the work in us for spiritual growth. That this isn't about us trying really hard and, you know, working in our own strength to grow up. No, God has promised that he will do the work in us. I love the New Living Translation of Philippians 2.13. It says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. See, God puts the desire in our heart and he gives us the strength to actually obey him and actually apply what he is teaching us and what he's showing us. He does the hard work inside of us. But There's the working out part that is up to us to do. And and I want to point something out very clearly. When the Apostle Paul tells us to work out our salvation, this verse has caused a lot of confusion over the years for some people. Some people have pointed to that verse and see, see, salvation has to be earned. Salvation is a works-based gift. Like we have to work to earn salvation. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And this verse is not telling us that we have to work for our salvation. It's telling us to work out our salvation, okay? It's very important to notice that this verse has been written to believers. It's not telling us how to be saved. It's telling us how to grow. It's speaking to people who already are saved. And it's saying, look, You have a responsibility not to work for your salvation, but to work out your salvation. I I can give you some illustrations to maybe help explain this and and understand this concept of working out our salvation a little bit better. First of all, let's think about the word working out when it comes to our physical body, right? Like we exercise and we work out to develop the body that we already have, right? We're, we're not working out in order to hope to get a body someday. It's the same with spiritual growth. We're working out the spiritual muscles that we already have. We're just developing them. We're not working for our salvation. Or maybe you've heard somebody talk about working out a puzzle. You know, think about a big jigsaw puzzle with a bunch of pieces the, the pieces are already there. You're not working to get the pieces. You're, you're working to put the pieces in order and to bring it all together. Uh, maybe just one other quick thought here is you think about a farmer. For those of us in an agricultural area, uh, you know, farmers work the land, right? W- what does that mean? It means that they are developing the land that they have. They're not working to get the land. 
they're working to develop the land they already have. So I just want to stress this very important detail. When scripture tells us to work out our salvation, it's not telling us to work for our salvation. It's telling us, look, God's going to do the heavy lifting. He's going to do the work in you, but you have to do the working out. You actually have to cooperate with the process and, and do your part for spiritual growth to take place. I think this is where many Christians fall away. They want God to do his part. We expect him to do his part. So often we're the ones that are not faithful to do our part. And if you were to say, well, John, what does that look like to to do my part, to work out my salvation? I I, I will show you a verse in Philippians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, how you were before you came to Christ, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we can see three things. If if you were to say, John, what does it look like to work out my salvation? What is my part? I know the part God plays, but what do I have to do in order to grow spiritually? There's three things, according to the Apostle Paul. Number one, I have to put off my old sinful behavior. So That is God's word telling us there are certain things in our life that are unholy, that are unrighteous, that are not right for godly, holy people. He's saying, stop it. And and in scripture, we find very specific commands of those things that we are not to do. So we put off the old sinful way of living. But notice this, church, this is not enough to just stop doing wrong things. We have two more things that the Apostle Paul says. First of all, he goes. the next thing he says is we have to change the way I think. We have to have our minds renewed, right? We have to learn to think differently. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be, re, but be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I knew there was a really important word in there, like transform, right? That's how we get transformed is we learn to think differently. And then we have to put on new habits. Paul says it's time to put on the new self. And this is where we start putting on the character of Christ by developing godly habits in our life. And the more we apply those habits, the more we engage in that new Christ-centered, Christ-empowered behavior the more our lives start to change and the more we look like Jesus, the more discipleship is taking place. I want to just give you three of those habits. There's many. I mean, we could talk about a lot of healthy, godly habits that that will develop Christ-like character in our life. But I just want to share three that are just fundamental if you desire to grow spiritually and if you're going to work out your salvation. The first one I would say is this. It's scripture reading and and scripture memorization. I put those two kind of hand in hand, even though technically they're two different things. But Christian, I have to ask you this question. What is your habit for spending time in the word of God and letting the word of God, the scriptures of God speak into your life? That is one of those habits. It needs to become a daily, regular, consistent habit in our life if we're going to grow spiritually. We need to know God's word. Another habit that we can put on is that of prayer. And I would add to that sitting in silence with the Lord. So prayer, we are talking with God, right? Like we're we're speaking to the Lord. But, but there's also that element of just sitting in silence and letting God speak to us, where we are setting time aside to connect with the Lord in conversation. He wants to speak with us, by the way. He wants us to to know his word so he can speak to us through that. And he wants us to spend time with him in prayer because he will speak with us in that as well. Here's another habit that I would give you that we need to be putting on when we think about putting on new godly habits of new behaviors. And it's simply this. It is the habit of gathering with God's people. And I'm talking about the church. That is, the church is God's people gathered together. 
And, and by the way, in our current world, we've been on this trajectory <clears throat> for a really long time, and it's not getting better in our post-COVID world where we see more and more Christians choosing not to gather together. and They're out of the habit. They are disconnected from the habit of regularly gathering with God's people. And when we do that, we do so to our own detriment. Like the Christian life is not meant to be lived out in isolation. Now we could go on with a bunch of other like good godly habits of serving and giving and so many other things, but I just wanted to focus on those three for the sake of this conversation when we talk about putting off the old self, renewing our mind, and putting on new habits that will develop Christ-like character in our life. So it is God's will for us to grow spiritually. That's the first statement. The second is that spiritual growth has two parts, God's part and my part. We have to work out our salvation. Okay, It's up There's responsibility that is on our shoulders to make that happen. Number three, here's the last statement that I want to make, and and I'm going to preach a little bit on this one, okay? I'm going to shine a spotlight on one of the reasons that we are failing to grow spiritually in our culture. If you would have, by the way, before I make that statement, I would just tell you this. If you were to have asked me years ago in my, you know, formation as I was growing up in the church and in in my own Christian faith and for years leading a church, if you were to say, John, why is it that people don't grow? Why don't Christians grow spiritually? One of the things I would have said then, and and I still believe this to be true today, but I'm going to go even a a little deeper, but I would have said um, that most Christians are educated beyond their obedience, meaning that the biggest issue is just that Christians don't obey. Like they know what they need to do. They just don't do it. And I still stand by that statement. I still believe that's true, but I want to go into an even deeper reason of why I believe that's true and what I believe it is that is standing as a huge roadblock for so many Christians when it comes to this subject of growing up spiritually and becoming truly committed followers of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm going to label it. Our spiritual growth, statement number three, our spiritual growth is often hindered by the excessive pace and volume of our daily lives. What do I mean by that? Well, I would tell you this, church. First of all, I believe that we, and I'm speaking myself included, this is not me preaching from a place of condemnation. This is me saying, me too. I believe that we are living lives that are way too busy. We have so much activity and chaos in our life. We simply do not have margin for periods of rest and solitude and spiritual growth. It's like, Lord, I'll grow if you can catch me on the run. Like, I, I want to grow spiritually, but... I don't really have any time in my calendar to make for you and the things that you would have for me. So if, if you can keep up with my pace of life, Lord, then then I, I sure, I'll, I want to grow spiritually. But otherwise, if I have to slow down to make that happen, it's probably not going to happen. We're too busy. The pace of our lives is way too full. And guys, I, this isn't getting better. I don't know if you've noticed in our culture, but the world is not slowing down. So if you're sitting back like waiting for someday, somehow, maybe things will slow down, unless we take control of our calendars and take control of our schedules, I'm here to tell you, it ain't slowing down anytime soon, my friends. And I wonder if there's a correlation, this is weird, that the the more our society drifts away from God, the busier we get. Do you think there's a connection there? Do you think maybe we're trying to fill a void in our life with constant activity and busyness because when we sit still, there's an emptiness that we don't want to acknowledge or face? Hmm. I think there's something there that we are way too busy. The average Christian, the reason they're not growing spiritually as God would desire for their life, they're too stinking busy. And right alongside of that, in addition to the pace of our lives, it is the incessant noise that that surrounds us and just inundates our life every day. And you're like, John, what what do you mean noise? Well, 
The noise comes from all of the distractions that are just at our fingertips. Look right here in the, just right here, our smartphones, right? Just in this brief time, I'm sitting here recording this message. I can see my smartphone is dinging and beeping and going off and there's emails popping in. And if it isn't that, it's TV. I just heard a uh, statistic the other day from Netflix saying that the average Netflix user can binge watch. We actually have a term for this now. They can binge watch an entire season of a TV series or a TV show in two days, two evenings, where people will just veg out in front of a TV and it's just noise. It's distraction. It's social media. It's so much noise and volume and frantic busyness in our life. And here's what I would contend, guys. If you've ever been in a place in your life, especially recently, if I'm speaking to anyone this morning that, that's watching this going, you know, John, I, I know I believe in God. I, I want to serve him with my life. I, I want him to be pleased with my life. I, I want to grow. I want to be a mature Christian. But John, if I were to be honest with you, I would tell you that I, it's been a long time since I've really felt close to God. I feel like he's very distant from me. I just feel like he's so far away and I haven't heard from him in a very long time. Can I just suggest that the problem probably isn't with God? See, it's not that God is unable to shout above all of the frantic pace and busyness and volume in our lives. I mean, he can shout above it all. The reality is, though, friends, so often he simply chooses not to. And he will wait for you to meet with him in a quiet place where he can speak in his tone, which is often in the tone of a whisper, a gentle, soft voice that will speak into your life but so often you and I are running around at such crazy paces and crazy level of noise that we don't hear God's voice. and We don't recognize the work that he's doing in our life because we're way too busy. And I would contend our calendar and the volume that stuff is coming at us, those are standing as major hindrances to the spiritual growth of so many Christians today. We're talking about discipleship, right? We're talking about being a follower of Jesus. And so I just want to show you one verse from the book of Mark that will, if, if we want to model our lives after Jesus, listen to this, Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And, and by the way, we see this several other times throughout the gospel. This was not some rare occurrence. It says, very early in the morning. And some of you might be thinking like, how, how early is that, John? Like maybe nine o'clock? Like, no, no, I probably not because of what it says next. Very early in the morning, well, it was still dark. Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus lived a life that was full of ministry. He had a lot of stuff coming at him every day, and yet he never seemed to be in a hurry he seemed to be open to people interrupting his day and getting on his calendar that he wasn't expecting because he had a level of a slow pace with which he walked through life. Where did that peace come from? How was it possible for Jesus, who had all of these demands in his day-to-day -day life, for him to just live in that place of peace and solitude and rest? Well, I would contend it was the practice, the habit the thing Jesus put on, if you will, the thing we need to put on in our lives, where very early in the morning we get up and go to a solitary place to meet with the Father in heaven. If it was important for Jesus, how much more so is it important for you and I to go to that lonely place where nobody's bothering us, where no emails and text messages and social media notifications and none of that's entering in because we're in this quiet place where we've stilled our activity, we've stilled our mind, we've silenced the noise, and we're in a place and a posture where we can sit quietly before the Lord and say, God, if you want to speak to me, I'm here. I'm here to read your word. I'm here to visit with you in prayer, to bring my needs and my requests before you and just to sit silently as you speak back to me about that. 
I have a feeling that what I'm describing is very likely lacking from your life this morning, isn't it? And I don't say that with judgment or condemnation. But I want you to understand, if you are truly going to be a Christ follower, this is what it looks like to follow Christ. He got up early while it was still dark. I know that sounds crazy to some of you. By the way, can I just say this? I'm going to rant for just a moment. I'm a morning person. Anybody who knows that about me knows that I love the morning. I love being up before the sun comes up. And I know you can call me crazy. Some of you and, and others have pushed back on that saying, well, John, I'm not a morning person. I am a night owl. I just want to validate that for a moment, okay? Because there are such things as night owls. You know what I mean when I say night owls? These are people that are wired to stay up late and, you know, they sleep in in the morning because they don't like the mornings. And so they stay up late. And that's when they creatively come alive. That's when their minds are the sharpest. I do not understand that because at nine o'clock at night, I'm ready for bed because I got up before the sun came up. I'm ready to go to sleep now. But Here's the thing. I just want to throw this at you real quick. And I'm having a little fun with you, but I am being serious as well. Here's a little diagnostic test that you can put yourself through to test that. Are you really a night owl as much as you say you are? It's very simple. Are you ready? If you're really a night owl, just like the real owls in nature, real owls are hunting and killing stuff in the nighttime hours, okay? So if you claim to be a night owl and you're not hunting and killing stuff, like, you know, metaphorically hunting and killing stuff, being productive in those hours, if your definition of being a night owl is staying up too late, watching mindless television, eating junk food, going to bed, then waking up feeling like crap, I'm here to tell you, you are probably not a night owl. You are probably an undisciplined morning person. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I have heard of people talking about, you know, their ability to have their quiet time with the Lord in the nighttime hours. That's when they are at their finest. And if that's honestly you, then be a night owl. That's great. I don't have an issue with that. Okay. But what I am saying is if that's not true of you, that, you know, your nighttime hours are just vegging out, my friend, I'm challenging you. I'm I, again, I'm not going to get legalistic on the very early in the morning while it's still dark. That's totally between you and the Lord. But I am going to push you a little bit in that direction to say, what would it look like if you got up at an earlier time and were intentional about going to that solitary place, that lonely place where the voice of God could once again be heard by you? It's, it's a huge part of your spiritual growth. So, Here's, here's another thought with that. And one more verse I want to share, and then I'm going to hit you with some questions. Psalm 46.10, I love this verse. A few years ago when I was just at a season of just struggling, frustration, burnout in my own life, God used this verse to just speak powerfully in a way that I needed, my soul needed so desperately in that season. Psalm 46.10 simply says, Be still and know that I am God. What an incredible invitation to just be still. My friends, I would challenge you as you go into your week, what would it look like for you even right now, today? Here would be a call to action to get out your calendar and to set an appointment with the Lord for whatever time works for you to get up at the hour necessary for you to get into that solitary place where you can just sit and be still. You're not up extra early so that you can get more work done. You're not up extra early so you can start jumping on social media and emails. No, you are up early to meet with the Lord because that's the most important appointment you will have. And what if you had that appointment every single day? How powerful could that be as a part of you working out your salvation. Because here's the good news. God has already shown us that he is going to do his part. He's going to work in us. As we work out our salvation, we will grow. And we will become more and more like Jesus Christ. I want to just ask you to think about this for yourself. Are you growing spiritually, my friend? What's discipleship look like in your life? It is God's will that you grow spiritually. Are you growing What does that look like and how are you doing in that area of your life? And again, I'm being so clear. I'm not asking that do you know more about Jesus? Do you know more Bible verses? Have you read more books? I'm asking 
Is your life truly being transformed to look like Jesus? Are you actually acting like Jesus in your daily life as you get up and go about your week? How would you answer that question for you? And finally, what action step would you take? What action step do you believe God would have you to take as a result of hearing this message today that it is God's will, he has a part, but so do you. And the pace and the noise at which we are living our lives is so often drowning out the voice of God in our life. What are you going to do with that? Let me pray for us and we will be dismissed today. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time that you've given to me just to share this message of truth with these people that you so dearly love. God, I thank you that it is your will for us to be disciples of Jesus, to be followers of Jesus. It's your will for us to grow up spiritually. Lord, I thank you that you have promised that you will do your part. You will do the heavy lifting, but I pray that we would be hearing and understanding that we also have a role to play as we work out our salvation, as we develop and grow spiritually. And Lord, I pray that today's simple message would be a strong reminder to those of us who are living in this very crazy paced and very noisy world, that it is our responsibility to get to that quiet place like Jesus did, where we can read your word, where we can hear from you, where we can speak with you, and where we can truly check in on a regular basis and walk with you again. Lord, I pray that you would use this message powerfully to help us continue to grow as true, committed disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. You will get all the praise and the honor and the glory for how you use this message in the life of our church and in our individual lives, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for tuning in to the Rescue Church's past messages. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses. If you'd like to learn more about The Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com.